Thank you, Robbie. Um, if you would, please turn in your Bibles to the book of Luke, where we will be looking at Luke chapter 1, verses 5 through 17. Uh, we began a series of sermons through the book of Luke last Sunday, looking at uh, chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, uh, and uh, seeing how um, Luke intended to uh, give us a, a, a reliable account of the gospel so that we might have certainty. Um, and so uh, we will notice throughout his book many references to historical um, events. Uh, so uh, there's a lot of history in his, in his writing um, and in eyewitness accounts. Um, so the, and that just adds to the believability. And, and you know, we, most of us, uh, of course, intuitively believe the Bible uh, in this particular church. That's not necessarily an issue, but the world around us certainly is not uh, does certainly does not certain or necessarily believe what we believe all the time. So it's good to know that we can be encouraged through the Word and by the Word, uh, according to the Word. So we pick up this morning in verse five of Luke chapter one, reading the following. In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah. And he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. But they had no child, because Elizabeth was barren, and both were advanced in years. Now while he was serving as priest before God, when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. And your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord. And he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. He will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. Let's pray. Father, as we consider now your word, by the same Holy Spirit that indwelt the prophet John, teach us. Draw us into your presence, Lord. Give us eyes to see Jesus and ears to hear your voice. And help us to worship. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The days of Herod, king of Judea, were dark days for the people of God. They were dark culturally and they were dark politically. Herod, in the words of Alistair Begg, was, quote, a nasty piece of work. I wish I had his Scottish brogue and I could say it like he says it because it just sounds so much more spiritual. But you'll have to take what you get, right? So, yeah. so he was, Herod was tyrannical, 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 cruel, suspicious, and vindictive. In short, he was, quote, not a, not a nice person. One commentator has written that as long as he lived, no woman's honor was safe and no man's life was secure. The Eerdman, uh, that, from, that's from the Eerdman commentary series. Additionally, it was apparently a common colloquialism in those days that it is safer to be Herod's pig than to be Herod's son. He had, I think it was two or maybe three of his sons murdered because he was afraid that they were going to try to take his throne. He had multiple wives, several of whom he also had murdered. He was detested by his people. No one liked this guy. Biblical readers especially remember him for having all the male children in the area surrounding Bethlehem 
uh, under two years old slaughtered after the wise men returned to their homes without telling them, telling him where they had found the Christ child. But as cruel as that act was, his other cruelty so overshadowed that event that Jewish historians don't even record what we know as the slaughter of the innocents. In other words, that, was, that event, the murder of all those children, however many it was, which it could have been a handful, it could have been multiple tens or up to a hundred, as many as it was, that was such a small drop in the bucket compared to the rest of Herod's depravity that the Jewish historians didn't even think about writing about it. Something that cruel didn't even make their records because... Not because it didn't happen, but because of what all the other stuff that did happen was so much worse. That's a bad guy. To make matters worse, the days of Herod were dark spiritually. So they were dark culturally and politically, but they were also dark spiritually. It had been 400 years since the last prophet of God spoke God's word to God's people. 400 years of silence. 400 years of nothing. And after so many years, the people of God were undoubtedly beginning to wonder if God still cared. Was he there at all? The days of Herod were dark days indeed. But in those dark days, God was at work. There was a priest named Zechariah, despite the cruelty of the king and the silence of the sovereign, God still maintained his ministry. And he was about to show this priest that he had not forgotten his people nor the promises that he made. In fact, it's fitting that it was Zechariah, Zechariah who was chosen that day to burn incense. For Zechariah's name literally means the Lord remembers. And it wasn't, if that wasn't enough, this priest, Zechariah, was married to another priest's daughter. She was of the house of Aaron, a priestly house. And her name was Elizabeth. Zechariah's name again means the Lord remembers. Elizabeth's name means my God is faithful or my God keeps his promises. It was through these two righteous people, as they are described by Luke, that God was about to show the world what he was doing. There was a problem, though. Luke describes Zechariah and Elizabeth as righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. They were, in other words, really good people. They kept the law. Now, they weren't perfect. We know that. They were people. So they were complicated. They were complicated. But according to the word of God, the inspired word of God, they were righteous before the Lord, blameless in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. And they lived by faith. Because, as the scriptures say, the righteous, about which they have been, by which they have been described, the righteous shall live by faith. And so we can deduct that they were faithful people. Still, there was a cloud over their home. Verse 7 says it all. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren. And both were advanced in years. According to the Baker New Testament commentary, barrenness was about the worst thing that could happen to a married woman. In the Old Testament, Rachel had begged Jacob, give me children or else I die. And Hannah wept bitter tears because she had no child. Again, according to the same commentary, unjustly, but all too often, the barren woman would be shunned looked down upon, despised by her neighbors. When they were younger, surely Zechariah and Elizabeth had held out hope that God would come to their aid and open Elizabeth's womb. For so many years, they undoubtedly prayed in faith for the joy that a child would bring. 
But now that hope had faded, for they were both advanced in years. They were past the point of childbearing, and so their days were spent in the routine of life under a cloud of sorrow. The days of Herod were dark days politically and dark days spiritually for the people of God. But for Zechariah and Elizabeth, they were also dark days personally. But God was at work in the dark. While Zechariah was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. Again, according to a commentator that I read, this service was, quote, considered a unique privilege. For the most solemn part of the entire liturgy was the burning of incense. It was then that the priest approached closest to the veil separating the holy place from the holy of holies where the very presence of God would be found. At no other time in his life would this man stand so close to the presence of God. Moreover, it was literally a a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity because after he had completed his task, his name would be removed from the list of potential priests who to render this service in the future. You only got to do it once. The priest would enter into the holy place and at a specified time pour incense over burning coals that had come from the fire of the burnt offering just outside of the, the holy place. And as the incense rose, he would offer his prayer, thanking God for his blessing and asking God to give Israel peace. And when the job was done, he would return to the people outside with his fellow priests blessed blessing the worshipers and with a recitation of the Aaronic blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. It was at this hour of incense, this holy moment, when the prayers of the people lifted to the heavens alongside the sweet aroma of the burning coals that the angel Gabriel appeared to Zechariah. And Luke says that Zechariah's reaction was exactly what ours would be. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. Steve Brown one of my favorite Bible teachers and seminary professors, has often said that if you've never stood in the presence of Jesus and been overwhelmed with fear, then you probably haven't stood in the presence of Jesus. The same can be said for his holy messengers. If you've ever encountered an angel of the Lord and not been overwhelmed with fear and dread, It probably wasn't an angel. Throughout Scripture, there is a consistent reaction to the sudden appearance of these heavenly beings, and that reaction is fear. It is dread, for the holy has entered and intermingled with the unholy. But there is also a consistent greeting when the angels speak. Do not fear. Do not be afraid. That very thing that we intuitively do, the angel says, don't. And really it's better translated, stop being afraid. Stop your fear. These were the words of the angel to Zechariah as well. Do not be afraid for your prayer has been heard. There is some dispute over what the angel, what prayer the angel was referring to, by the way. Was it Zechariah's priestly prayer for the deliverance of God's people that was part of this religious ritual? Or is there an indication that Zechariah was praying something deeply, more deeply personal? Perhaps a child to carry on his family name. These are arg- there are arguments, legitimate arguments for both views. And the fact is that the scripture is actually silent on the subject of Zechariah's prayer that the angel refers to. I would suggest, though, that it doesn't have to be the case of either one against the other. I can imagine with those of the one camp that Zechariah had given up all hope 
of producing an heir. He was, after all, advanced in years, and so was his wife. But that doesn't mean that there wasn't a time when he had prayed that prayer in the past and even prayed it fervently in great faith and hope and anticipation. Any parent who's experienced the, the pain of infertility knows the fervency of the prayer for God's intervention. Still, there comes a time when we all resign ourselves to the fact that God may not answer our prayers in the way that we had hoped. And so we turn from praying these great prayers of expectation to prayers of duty, prayers of responsibility. And even then we do so wondering if those prayers might be left unanswered too. But what if God was answering Zechariah's prayer from years gone by simultaneously with the prayer that he had just lifted up as part of his priestly duty for the people of Israel. What we tend to forget, God remembers. Zechariah had undoubtedly prayed for the son years before, and he would have prayed for the consolation of Israel that day. As a priest married to the daughter of a priest, Zechariah may have even prayed for a son who would be the consolation of Israel. After all, it was every Jewish woman's desire to be the mother of the Messiah. That was just ingrained in who they were. They knew that God was going to send a Messiah. They knew that it would be that that birth, that son would be born of a woman. And so every little Jewish girl was raised believing, maybe, maybe I will have the privilege of bearing the Christ child. Zechariah's son wouldn't be the Messiah, but he would play a prominent role in God's kingdom nonetheless. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, the angel said, and you shall call his name John. Just like his father's name and his mother's name, John's name has a special significance. Zechariah, again, means the Lord remembers. And Elizabeth means my God is faithful. John means the Lord has been gracious. So the son of the Lord remembers and my God is faithful would point God's people to the graciousness of God. In fact, he would literally point to God's grace incarnate. You will have joy and gladness, continued the angel, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb, and he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will go before him in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. John would not be, again, would not be the the Messiah, but he would be the voice of one crying in the wilderness as the forerunner of the Christ. He would fulfill the last prophecy of the Old Testament and would do so in the spirit and the power of Elijah. The last recorded words of God in the Old Testament are in Malachi 4, verses 5 and 6. They are, Behold, I will send you, Elijah, the prophet, before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. Malachi 4, 5-6. Sound familiar? It should. It's essentially the very same message from the angel Gabriel as he stood beside Zechariah at the altar of incense. The days of Herod were dark indeed, but God was at work in the dark. And the work he was about to do would pierce the darkness in such a way that the darkness could not overcome it. John would point God's people to God's Messiah, our Lord, Jesus Christ. He would say of Jesus, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He must increase, but I must decrease. 
And in this way, John would truly become great before the Lord. For he would be a physical as well as a vocal reminder that no matter how dark the world around you seems, God is working all things together for your good and his glory. He hears your prayer. He sees your struggle. He knows your pain. And he gave his son that we might know him in return. In fact, it was at the darkest point of human history that God did his greatest work. In Luke 23, verses 44 through 46, we read, It was now about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, while the sun's light failed. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two. And then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Do you see the connection between the darkness of the days of Herod and Zechariah, the man whose name says the Lord remembers standing so close to the curtain Offering, offering up the incense and the prayers of the people. The connection between that event and then the event on, at Golgotha, a Calvary on the cross, where when Jesus, the darkness covers the land, the sun fails, darkness for three hours, and Jesus cries out. And the temple curtain, that same curtain that Zechariah stood feet away from, tears from the top to the bottom, saying no longer is there a separation. This was the work that the angel was announcing God was about to do. I'm sending my son. I'm piercing the darkness. The light of mankind is entering into the world so that you can see me in all my brilliance. And you no longer have to fear because I'm going to take your sin and I'm going to put it on his back. And he's going to die so that you might live. That, that is amazing. That's what God is doing in the dark. It has been said that the only thing you have to do to spend eternity separated from God is to refuse the grace of God so freely offered in the gospel of Jesus Christ. I tend to agree. Your world may be darker than you can describe, but Jesus Christ came into this world as the light of men so that he might pierce the darkness and shine the light of God's love, mercy, and grace on those who believe. And this is the testimony of John concerning Jesus. I have seen and borne witness that this is the Son of God. What about you? Have you come to the point of recognizing the darkness in your own life? Have you run to Jesus and asked Him to shine His light into your heart, into your darkness in and around you? And have you trusted the light of the world to shine through you into a darkened world that He might become greater even as you become less? The world can be a very dark place. But where the darkness of sin abounds, the light of God's grace abounds all the more. For God is still at work in the dark. To Him be the glory, both now and forever. Let's pray. Father, thank You. Thank You that You are still at work in the midst of a darkened world a world darkened by confusion and a world darkened by outright volitional sin where so many turned their backs, gone their own way, we among them in times past, and yet, Father, you have shined your light in our lives. You have shown us the depravity of our sin, but you have also shown us the greatness of your grace. Please, Lord Jesus, if any within the sound of my voice 
is walking through darkness and hell, would you shine the light of your grace into their lives that they might know you and know the joy of your salvation and come to live for you, letting your light shine in and through them. And Father, for those of us who do know you, Lord, that the world can still be a dark place. And so, Father, I pray and we pray together that you would shine, so shine your light in us that, that we would be a light in the darkness. And help us to have that attitude of John that we must become less so that Christ may become more. Oh, God, teach us. Teach us how to live this way for your glory, for the kingdom's advancement. And yes, Father, for our good. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Y'all stand and sing with us our hymn of response. All must we bow.